Welcome to the Raisina Fireside Chat session on pandemic technology and AI, a story from Africa. And with me to narrate this story today is uh, Nanjita Sambuli, fellow from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the United States. Welcome, Nanjita. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, as we know, in fact, the pandemic has been all pervasive. It has uh, uh, essentially affected all forms of human endeavors, starting from the social, economic, as also, in fact, the cultural and, the, and all forms of interactions that we are having, in fact, in various spheres. Now, for, on the other side, what we also find is that uh, there has been an opportunity that has been created by the digital space to combat the impacts of this pandemic. Now, as far as this digital space is concerned, uh, the, the, the impacts or the effects, final effects, have been quite variable. It's quite heterogeneous. Now, what has been its impacts as far as the global south is concerned? What are the stories or the fascinating stories that are emerging from the fascinating landmass of Africa? Have they been able to combat this pandemic uh, through the digital space? Now, Nanjira, in, in fact, with this backdrop, the first question that I have is, uh, as we know, that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of the adoption of uh, internet yes. and internet penetration all across the African landmass. In Kenya, we find around 82% of internet penetration, whereas in South Sudan, it's as low as 8%. Mm -hmm. So given this and given the fact that you have to get yourself connected, the landmass needs to get itself connected to the global value chains through this digital space, how is essentially Africa reacting to these changes? I think the pandemic made very clear that investment in internet penetration or internet access is no longer a luxury or put off to later uh, sort of priority. It became a must have and has actually necessitated um, requests by, made by the African governments to international practitioners, uh, development communities and so on to support that. That's been very interesting because then it does show the diversity of the landmass insofar as those who can easily be connected to fiber optic cables that are just drawn out from the oceans to those who are landlocked in the unique ways that they can get uh, connected. And so that movement is already happening. Just last month, Google's fiber optic cable landed in the shores of West Africa as it continues on from West Africa to the southern tip of Africa. Kenya just received its fourth internet fiber optic cable landing on its shores, and those will be also moving into their neighboring countries, so South Sudan, mm -hmm. Uganda, and others hopefully could get part of the backbone that comes through that way. But it also does remind us that penetration is one part, availability rather is one part, Correct. accessibility is another. And those two things do have to also be considered simultaneously. So in fact, I think Kenya's adoption or penetration rate has increased uh, at least in mobile to about 96% oh. of, of, the, of the region, uh, or even the population is within 3G coverage if mm -hmm. we're looking at mobile alone. But that does not translate to people actively using these services. So we have that, in a sense, places where there is a f availability. Now come the issues of accessibility, affordability, meaningful use, and sustained use, mm. uh, as well as those who are trying to get all of it. And there's an opportunity, lastly, for countries that have not yet sort of gotten that penetration level high enough to to learn from what does not work and figure out strategies that take a 360 degree view to fast track how they actually get their populations connected. Okay, so, 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 so let me take it from there. Suppose as you talked about accessibility and, and uh, definitely you know, given uh, the level of digital divide across the landmass, all we can make out is that uh, there is some kind of uh, an inequity in terms of uh, uh, what we call the wherewithal or the bandwidth in terms of adoption of mm -hmm. the technology. Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, what we find is that the large component of the services, especially in the global south as also in the global north, has been shifting to the digital space. Mm -hmm. But again, there are many who are not able to do that. Right. I presume that's, that's a phenomenon of the global south. So, uh, so is it that these services or these industries are going to get eliminated in the process? So I, I doubt they will get eliminated. They might just become uh, more, head, more of a headache to get services and to in integrate. That said, there is resilience that does show that 
people are not necessarily waiting for the perfect set of conditions to connect them. You see um, a, a phenomenon I like to call remixing right. of you, your typical tools. I mean, WhatsApp is no longer just a communication tool. Mm. It's a, we know this across the global south. It is a business tool. It is an ex you know, it's a very mm. multifaceted tool. And companies like Meta are responding to that and trying to figure out how to sustain that. We also see that increasingly, if a government of any region actually does digitize its services, it does necessarily lead to adoption because they have to make sure that they are, those services are not only provided on their end, but can be used on the, on the, on the, on the sort of uh, user end. And right. that does introduce that dynamic. I think that there may be elimination of those that are not fit for age, mm. but it's not because it will be that we did not digitize. They may just have been redundant as it were. So there's a really interesting opportunity there to actually refresh um, what is service provision, especially sort of government to citizens through digital. Uh, businesses are getting creative about the ways that they use they may not have the fanciest website, but I, like I said, they will mm. use WhatsApp, they will find creative ways, they'll even find file sharing mechanisms that bypass you know, the costs of internet. Mm. That creativity tells us that there's always going to be a way the signal will be sent that these parts, these businesses, these communities, these small, small enterprises are there to be seen and to be registered. The big question will be how the systems of support will uh, enable them to actually come up to a level that sustains what they've set out to do. Right, so, so, so on the one hand, I mean, there are going to be the winners and the losers of any game. Yeah. So just for the, at the cost of being a bit provocative, <laughs> let me just put across this question to you. On the one hand, we talk about technology being inclusive and internet being inclusive so that because the reach, as far as the reach is concerned, if you have access to it, then it's going to be massive, no mm -hmm. doubt about that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, those who don't have this wherewithal in themselves, it's not always a policy driven issue. Mm -hmm. At times, it also has to be driven by communities, driven by private initiatives. So it can also be exclusionary in the process. Mm -hmm. So is that this, this exclusionary element or exclusionary characteristic of technology, can this lead to unemployment? Because that's, that's an assumption, of course, a hypothesis that can be posed in here. Can this lead to unemployment and eventually to social strifes, and which, which of course, is, uh, you know, in a developing world and an underdeveloped world has been one of the major, uh, I would say, uh, a force of conflict, a mm. major stressor, social mm -hmm. stressor? Mm. You know, in, in a sense, there's already such exclusion, as it were, from, say, right. economic activity right. for some. is a sense of a, of a marginalized, significant population. Mm that digital will only sort of amplify that mm. rather than necessarily create that. It may disrupt for those who are already connected in a precarious manner. And we see this in the gig economy, as it's called. Right. The labor dynamics are shifting just as we were getting labor laws and, you know, rightful work in formal employment and that kind of thing sort of figured out, digital comes in and disrupts that altogether. It, it, it has introduced short-term gains in terms of the flexibility of working and all that, but we are seeing the downsides of that, the uh, number of hours you have to work, the algorithms just slowing down when you get access. No control, right. you know, at mm. a country level to say platform X that's trying to use algorithmically determined mechanisms mm. to make your services available can be, you know, sort of... Uh, legislated in the country. So it's creating different dynamics of what we understand as winners and losers. I always like to say that sometimes, ironically, for those who already, some of the challenges we talk about with digitization will have the, the extremely excluded and, the, and the, the, uh, are two, two kinds of people. Mm -hmm. The poor who have not been connected anyway, and not poor in the sense of poverty in a one dollar a day thing, right. but factors have led it that they are not access, the infrastructure is not available to them. And the super rich who can pay their way out right. of being connected. So it changes the dynamic of what we understand as winners and losers in the digital dimension. And this mm. is going to be one to, that might disrupt even how we measure progress in this regard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So, so uh, uh, that comes another dimension to this entire thing that is related to the mental health. And, uh, you know, the pandemic as a global common, that is something uh, it has really affected, uh, uh, in fact, globally. Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, definitely it has created opportunities for us. We have been uh, stuck to the digital world. Productivity might have increased because of uh, this access mechanism. On the other hand, 
what we find is that the very human touch is lost. Mm -hmm. We can definitely access the doctors, the medical practitioners and others through the internet. On the other hand, uh, this has also aggravated the mental health to a certain extent, which has also been, uh, you know, affected the human capital and human productivity mm. on the other side. Mm -hmm. The social capital element of things. So how do you reckon that this is going to, this has unfolded or going to unfold in the African landmass? The mental health angle to this, I'm quite glad we're talking about it already because I think even in a previously analog world, the mm. conversations about mental health were almost, in a sense, stigmatized. Right. So for, on one hand, it's fascinating to see the language of mental health become a priority, the mm. same way we'll talk about connecting people or harms or benefits to society. What I have witnessed um, in the case of conversations about mental health is, yes, there's that loss of touch and human connection and especially for younger generations in their most formative periods that has spawned off that crisis that could you know play out but also for many others the language people have found the language through these platforms to talk about mental health right so there's that give and take aspect to it i have yeah. seen at least in my country in kenya the conversations about mental health people giving each other the language creating new forms of community limited to what digital can offer that hopefully can go off back offline create opportunities for people to get help um, so it's been that sort of double-edged sword hmm. and i think it will remain that way um, where technology gives and technology can take but how do we make sure that in that dance the shade hmm. of gray there right. we at least make sure a lot more people are emerging better off for it okay so thank you so much uh, in fact uh, we we how do we conclude here because frankly speaking uh it's very difficult to conclude <laughs> There are winners and losers of the scheme. And in any case, technology has always brought about this kind of disruptive innovation, disruptive innovative practices. Mm -hmm. And in the process, we have to adapt to this change. It's interesting, the narration that you put across from the, the, from the African landmass itself, it shows a huge amount of heterogeneity on the one hand. And Africa is trying to cope up with that. That's very clear. So uh, let's see, in fact, how, in fact, in the medium and the wrong, long run, uh, the winners emerge and mm. the losers emerge. But mm. definitely, we would like to see more winners than the losers. Yes. So many thanks. Thanks for your time. Yeah. And thanks for putting across a very succinct statement on from Africa. Thank you Pleasure. so much.